All right, so how do we sift through many, many voices of a society to find the collective voice of a group? So how do you decide what the voice of a group is when there are a lot of diverse ideas and opinions in there? How well does this voting thing that we do work? Um, is it fair? So these are the kinds of things that we're going to study in our voting theory chapter. So it may seem kind of obvious and straightforward, right? This is because it's so ingrained in us. It's something that we grow up with as um, the fairest way to do things, right? So you just count the balance. Use that count to determine the outcome of an election in a consistent and fair manner. But surprisingly, what we're going to see is that if we have an election that involves three or more choices, there is no consistently fair method for determining a winner. Okay, there's always going to be um, a situation where you might, sit, you might cry foul, right? So we're going to study this sort of counterintuitive result. It's called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. Um, we're going to try to come at that result by looking at several different methods of vote counting and seeing if we can try to come up with a fair one. Okay, so let's say I was going to show a movie in class, which I'm not, but let's say I was going to. What, um, I need three nominations of movies that we could watch. Night Club, Night Club okay. Jump Street, 21 Jump Street. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have th Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you're a person who prefers to listen and not write, these will all be on Moodle later today, so it's up to you. All right, so now what I would like is for everyone to write down your first, second, and third choice from the list. So this is called um, a preference ballot. When you, instead of just voting for your favorite, you vote for your first, second, and third choice. So on your own little paper there, put down your preference. So let's see, I think that I would go A, C, does everybody have their choices down? Okay, so before we count up the votes and decide what movie we're not going to watch, um, I just want to take a few notes about preference ballots. Okay, So the, one of the nice things about a preference ballot is that a voter's preferences are transitive. So transitive means if, the, if someone likes A better than B, and likes B better than C, what conclusion can you draw? Yep. You got it. That's what transitive means. Yep. If they like A better than C, or sorry, A better than B, and they like B more than C, then we can conclude that they'll like A better than C. Right. So if for some reason B was no longer an option, right, um, blockbuster's out of it, then we don't have to go back to that person and say, which would you prefer, A or C? We know, right? <clears throat> we know that A is their first choice. And that's exactly what I just said here. Relative preferences are not affected by the elimination of a candidate, right? So if B were suddenly gone, we know that A, C will be this candidate's or this voter's preferences. So if we like A better than B better than C and B is eliminated, we know that this person would vote A over C. So this can be really helpful and time-saving in cases where a candidate gets eliminated. You don't have to have everyone go back to the voting booth 
and recast their ballot um, based on the fact that someone was eliminated. Okay, so what I'd like to do is gather all the voting information for, from the class in this table that we call a preference schedule. Okay, so let's see, all the different ways we could vote would be A, B, C, A, C, B. So those are the two ways that A could come in first, right? B could come in first, and then we could have A and C, or C and then A. Or C could come in first, and we could have A and then B, or B and then A. OK, so um, I'm going to attempt to do this show of hands. There's a lot of people in here. How many people voted A, B, C? Raise your hand really high if you voted A, B, C. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think. So we have A, B, C. The number of people who voted that way are seven. So we put a seven at the top there. All right, raise your hand if you voted A, C, B. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we put a four above that column. Five, I missed one? Okay, thanks. Okay, how about BAC? Show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we got eight. All right, how about BCA? One, two, three. Okay. CAB? One. Okay. CBA? One, two, three, four. All right. So this is a good way that we can summarize the results of an election where you use a preference um, ballot. Okay, so based on this, these results, this is sort of a summary of the whole class's preferences. What movie should I show in class? 21 Jump Street, why do you think that? Okay. What do you think? Okay, so we have 12 people. Yes, we have 12 people who have A in first place and 11 who have B in first place. Okay, so that's, that's good. So we have um, A with the most first place votes. Um, is that the best way to decide who wins, the, the movie that gets the most first place votes? Yep. What do you think? Okay. I believe there are 30. That only adds up to 28? Oh, I didn't put, yeah. Oh, okay. 28. Still not a majority. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we should consider second place and last place. Like, how many people have A? What was A? Fight Club? We have seven people who have A in last place. Um, what, if, what if everyone else had A in last place? There are these 12 have it in first place. What if everyone else had it in last place? Would we still think that A should be the, the winner? No. So it might help if we could somehow create a method that looks at the rest of the preferences and not just first place. Sometimes just the number of first place votes is a great way, right? Sometimes that seems totally fair. But there are situations where it might seem unfair.
So the first method we're going to study for choosing a winner of an election is called the plurality method. Th that is the most first place votes. That's what we did sort of automatically over here. When we said A should win, that's called the plurality method. It's the most common, best known method for determining the winner of an election. It's a natural extension of the majority rule principle, which is what you were um, referring to. What's your name? Crystal, thank you. Um, what you were referring to um, a couple minutes ago, that if a majority of the people wanted that, then yeah, the majority rules. That's sort of our, one of our most fundamental principles. Um, it's just sort of a, an extension of majority rule, right? It states that in an election between two candidates, the candidate, candidate with the majority should be the winner. So that's, that's the majority rule idea. But in a plurality election, if there are two or more candidates, the candidate with the most first place votes wins. So we call someone who has a majority of the votes a majority candidate, and we call someone who has the most first place votes the plurality candidate. So in an election with only two candidates, what can you say about the plurality candidate? Yep, what do you think? They got the most votes. They got the most votes. Yep. Yep, they have the most votes. Do they have more than half the votes? Yes. Yes. If there's only two candidates, the person who has the most has to have more than half. Does that make sense? If they split evenly, it'd be a tie. So for someone to have more than the other, they have to have more than half. Okay, so in, if there's only two candidates, the plurality candidate is also the majority candidate. So you could just say, imagine there are 100 voters. If there's only two candidates, and I got 51 votes, and what's your name? Chris. Chris got 49. I would be the plurality candidate because I have the most votes. I also have 51, which makes me a majority candidate because I have more than half the votes. All right, so using the plurality method, what movie should the class watch? We already said that was A, uh, Fight Club. So what are some good things about the plurality method? What do you like about it? Easy. Easy, yeah. Easy, simple. Count up the number of first place votes. The one with the most is the winner. What do you not like about it? What do you mean by correct? It's not, it always Great. So it's... Um, not a good reflection. Oops. Of the group, maybe. In some instances, it may not be a good reflection of what the group wants. Here's an example of a weird thing that can happen with plurality. What if you have 10 candidates? and there are 100 voters, it would be possible for a candidate to win with 11 votes, right? Everybody gets 10 votes, one candidate gets 11, and one candidate gets 9. That seems like an awfully small number of people determining the outcome of an election. Okay, so more candidates. means you need fewer votes to win. Okay. Right, yep. <laughs> you can just go after your specific demographic. Yep. So 
So here is sort of one of our most basic um, fundamentals of fairness that we grow up learning. Um, there are several things that make an election fair, but here's sort of our most fundamental one. First and most basic expectation is that if someone has a majority, then they should win the election. Okay. It doesn't say that it should take a majority to win, but it says that if someone happens to get a majority, there should, there should be no question that that person should win the election. Okay. So does the plurality method always satisfy this? No, it doesn't, right? Because it's possible to have the most first place votes win the election, but not have a majority of first place votes. Have the most first place votes. but less than a majority. Wait. Okay, but if you're using the plurality method and somebody gets a majority, there are 10 candidates, right? Someone has 51 votes. They have a majority of the votes. Are, will they win the plurality method? Yes, because there's only 49 left to be split amongst the other nine candidates, right? So that's what the majority criterion says. It actually says that if a candidate gets the majority, then they should win. There's no way in the, plura in the plurality method that somebody could get a majority and not win. So this is actually a very common flaw in reading an if-then statement. Okay, so here's here's a little example. My rule for myself is, if it's not raining outside, I go for a run in the morning. Okay. So tell me if I've broken my rule. I'm going to give you some various scenarios, and you tell me if I broke the rule. The rule is, if it's not raining, I go for a run. Okay. If I wake up in the morning, and it's raining, and I don't go for a run, did I break the rule? No. Okay. If I wake up in the morning, and it's sunny, and I go for a run, did I break the rule? No. Nope. If I wake up in the morning, and it's sunny, and I don't run, did I break the rule? Yes. That's how you break the rule. What if I wake up in the morning and it's raining and I still decide to go for a run? Did I break the rule? No. The rule is if it's not raining, I must run. I don't my rule says nothing about what happens, what I should do if it is raining. It doesn't say I must not run. Right? So if it is raining, I sort of have the choice. As long as the only way I can break the rule is if it's sunny and I don't run. I'm allowed to still go out and run if it's raining. So it's that's um, a very common if-then issue. Okay, so the plurality method does always satisfy the majority criterion. Yes, because okay. the only way to break this rule, the rule says that if someone has a majority, they must win. The only way to break the rule is to have someone get a majority and not win. Like the only way to break the rule, my running rule, is to have it be sunny and I don't run. So, yes, if someone gets a majority, they will always win using plurality. Does that make sense? The only way to break the rule is to have someone get a majority of the votes and not win, which is impossible in this method.
Okay, so here's another um, fairness criterion. Okay. A basic thing that makes an election seem fair. We call it the Condorcet criterion. Condorcet is a mathematician's name, the guy who came up with it. So it says, if candidate X, if there is a candidate that is preferred by the voters over each of the other candidates in a head-to-head -head comparison, then candidate X should be the winner of the election. So if I went around to every person in the room and said, who do you prefer, A or B? Who do you prefer, A or C? C. I say A. A. Okay. <laughs> and they did that for everybody, and everybody preferred or, or uh, get X. everybody prefers A over any other candidate, A should win, right? If you match them up head to head. So we'll do a little example. We have uh, Tasmania State University's marching band. They have been invited to perform at five different bowl games, the Rose Bowl, the Hula Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Sugar Bowl. So there are 100 members of the band. This is how they voted. So 49 people chose Rose, Hula, Fiesta, Orange, Sugar. 48 people chose Hula, Sugar, Orange, Fiesta, Rose. And three renegade band members chose Fiesta, Hula, Sugar, Orange, Rose. So which bowl should the band perform at um, if we use the plurality method? Orange shirt. Rose Bowl, yeah. 49 first place votes for Rose. Okay. What do you think about the plurality method in this instance and the Condorcet criterion? So let's let's do a head-to-head -head matchup. Okay, so let's do Rose against everybody else. So we'll do an election with just Rose against Hula, Rose against Fiesta, Rose against orange, rose against sugar, and rose against one, two, three, that's it. Okay. So if the only options were rose and hula bowl, right, go back to the preference schedule, all the other options are off the table. You can't pick them. These 49 people, who would they pick, rose or hula? Rose. They have Rose ranked above Hula, right? So Rose against Hula, 49 people would choose Rose. These 48 people, would they choose Hula or Rose? Hula, because they have Hula ranked above Rose. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm going to look at those three, too. Yeah. So we have these 48 would go Hula. And then these three, they can't get Fiesta. It's not their, it's, Fiesta's out of the running, right? But which would they, if they had to choose between Hula and Rose, which would they choose? Hula, because it's ranked high above Rose, right? So these three choose Hula. So this head-to-head -head matchup is 49 Rose Bowl to 51 Hula. So who wins this head-to-head -head matchup? Hula. All right, so instead of doing, um, so Rose Bowl is definitely not a Condorcet candidate because in order to be Condorcet, you have to win all your head-to-head -head matchups. So Rose Bowl is out for being Condorcet. It just lost a head-to-head -head matchup to Hula. So let's see what happens if I compare Hula to everybody else. What if I do Hula to Orange, Hula against Fiesta, and Hula against the Sugar Bowl? So Hula against the Orange Bowl, these 49, who would they pick? Hula, that's, Hula is ranked above Orange. These 48, would they pick Hula or Orange? Hula. And these three, Hula or Orange? Hula. So we have 100 to nothing, Hula against Orange. So Hula wins again. Okay, what do we get for... Um, Hula and Fiesta, 100 to 0. So Hula wins that one. 
Okay, thank you. 97 to 3. And what about hula and sugar? 100 to 0. So hula wins that one also. So hula is what we would call a Condorcet candidate. Hula wins all of its head-to-head -head matchups. Hula is a Condorcet candidate because it wins all its head-to-head -head matchups. But who won the election using plurality? The Rose Bowl, yeah. So we have a Condorcet candidate. We have a candidate that's preferred over every other candidate when we do a head-to-head -head matchup, but they did not win the election. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened is we violated the Condorcet criterion. So the Condorcet criterion that says, says that if there's a candidate preferred over the other candidates in head-to-head -head comparisons, they should win. But we have such a candidate in this example, and they lost. Okay, so the band election violates the Condorcet criterion. How about our movie election? Did it have a Condorcet candidate? I'll have to go back and look. Here's our preference schedule. Okay, so is there a Condorcet candidate? Is there a candidate that would win head-to-head -head over everybody else? C would win over everybody else? Let's see. So if I do C against A, these seven would vote for A, these five would vote for A, these eight would vote for A, these three would vote for C. This one and four would vote for C. So A wins that matchup. So do, so can C be Condorcet? No, because the only way to be Condorcet is if you win all of your head-to-head -head matchups, right? C just lost one. So um, let's see if A is head-to-head. -head. See if A is Condorcet. Let's do B against A. So these seven people, would they choose A or B? A. How about the next five? A. And the next eight? And the next three? And this one? A. And these four? B. Okay, so let's see. We have eight, 12, 15. Seven and five is 12, 13. So B wins. So A is not Condorcet, right? Because A lost a head-to-head -head matchup. There's only one matchup left, B versus C. Who would win B versus C? B? Well, let's see. Uh, we'd have 7 for B, 5 for C, 8 and 3 for B. One. Four for C, so B wins. Yep. So 
Candidate B, have they lost a head-to-head -head matchup? Nope, they went against A in one and went against C in one. Those are the only other two candidates. So candidate B, which was 21 Jump Street? No, I think that was C. 21 Jump Street is the Condorcet candidate. There isn't always a Condorcet candidate, right? So it just happens that we have one in this case. But who won this election? A, Fight Club. So B might be a better choice in terms of um, a compromise candidate. Right? Yep. Whoever has got the power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of the question about, like, um, redistricting, right? Um, they redraw district lines all the time in t to create, uh, you know, Democratic or Republican strongholds um, for the congress for congressional districts. And whoever's in power is the one who gets to draw the districts. So... They draw them in their own party's favor. So it's who whoever's in power gets to choose the voting method. Unless you have people vote on it, but you still need a method, right? So um, another major flaw of the plurality method, <clears throat> aside from the fact that you can win with very few votes when there's a lot of candidates, um, is that the results can be manipulated by a single voter or a block of voters through something called insincere voting. So in insincere voting, if you know that the candidate you really want to win has no chance of winning, then often you'll decide that rather than waste your vote on that candidate, then on your favorite candidate, then you'll cast your vote for a lesser choice who has a better chance of winning the election. So does anyone have um, an example? You would what? Write in. Write in? Well, a write-in candidate would probably have no chance of winning, right? <laughs> so what, where is there an example in real life where we saw insincere voting? People didn't vote for their favorite because they knew they wouldn't win and voted for somebody else instead. Ralph Nader. That's sort of the classic example, the modern classic example. Ralph Nader in 2000. Okay. People whose favorite candidate might have been Ralph Nader instead voted for Al Gore because they just didn't want Bush to win. Right. So Ralph Nader didn't get as many votes as probably he, he had supporters. <clears throat> so in this marching band election, these three members who voted F-H-S-O-R, right, they picked Fiesta Bowl as their first choice. Let's say that they know nobody else wants Fiesta Bowl. They know they're the only three. Um, so they know they have no chance of getting Fiesta Bowl. How could they have changed their votes to create a result more to their liking? Assuming we're using the plurality method, right, in which Rose Bowl wins with a 49. Yeah, what were you saying? They don't like what? They don't like the Rose Bowl. They have Rose Bowl in last place. They don't want to go there, right? So they might just sw switch these two. So they might do Hula, Fiesta, Sugar, Orange, Rose. Because then Hula would win with... 51 votes okay, using the plurality method. So a pretty simple um, trick there. They just voted not according to what they really wanted, but to prevent an outcome they didn't want. OK, we already talked about this. So. 
because we have this insincere voting issue um, in American politics, um, that whole Ralph Nader thing, the consequence of that is that we have a really entrenched two-party system. Because it's really hard for a third candidate to get votes. Because people don't want to waste their vote um, on a candidate they don't think can win. So we have this two-party system that it's really hard for anyone else to get any votes. If you're not part of blue or red. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions? That's okay. <laughs>